Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello, and welcome to James Bond Radio. My name's Tom Sears, and this week I am joined by none other than Gareth Owen, the man behind Bond Stars, the man behind Roger Moore, and the author of a new book, Raising an Eyebrow, My Life with Sir Roger Moore. So we're going to chat to Gareth in a second, but before we do, I just want to introduce you to the newest member of the JBR family, Little Pippa. Look at that little face. Oh my goodness me. She is a little 13 week old sausage dog puppy. And she's been keeping us very busy, haven't you? <coughs> Equal parts adorable and a bit of a troublemaker, let's be honest. So there she is. Oh, look at that little face. Okay, shall we chat to Gareth then, Pips? Yeah, I think that was a little nod. All right, let's do it. Let's talk to Gareth Owen. <laughs> My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion for all things 007. You see, as you can see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down, 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, who is the Bond? I expect you to die. Welcome, Gareth Owen, author of Raising an Eyebrow, My Life with Sir Roger Moore, and author of many other things as well. How are you doing, Gareth? Hello, Tom. I'm okay, thanks. Nice to speak with you. Good, good. You too, man. How are you feeling in this whole uh, coronavirus climate, man? Are you, are, you, uh, uh, are you doing okay? Well, yeah, I seem to be quite busy, which, which is nice. Uh, I'm not doing anything in particular, but keeping yeah. myself busy. So, you know, I mean, it's better than sitting around watching TV, I suppose. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I, uh, I'm, as you might be able to hear, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit croaky in the old throat today, so I'm, uh, I'm Ooh. drinking plenty of water and hoping for the best. But you, know, you never know. So, Gareth, the the man, the enigma, the the legend behind Bond stars. We want to get to know you a little bit more today, and uh, there is no better way to get to know a Bond fan than the JBR quickfire questions. So, question number one, Mr. Gareth Owen, what is your favourite Bond film? Well, it has to be the first one I saw at the cinema, which was Spy Who Loved Me. Very nice. A good choice. And what is it about Spy Who Loved Me that you like so much? Just the escapism, the entertainment, the larger-than-life villains, the, the fantastic gadgets, the underwater car, the ski jump off the edge of the cliff. Just everything, really. Just great yeah. fun. <laughs> that is a good one. You can't, you can't go wrong with Spy Who Loved Me, as far as I'm concerned. That is a, that is a belter, as we say. Question number two, what is your favourite Bond book? On book, oh gosh, uh, excluding my own. Um, of course. Uh, I'd have to say probably on a Magic Secret Service because for me that was such a great story. Yeah, and wait, so when did you when did you read your those, those kind of books? Did, was that when you were I, a kid or? Yeah, I suppose I started buying them from sort of secondhand bookshops and flea markets when I was probably about fourteen or fifteen. Yeah. So, you know, obviously the books are very different to the films. And it was interesting to discover the sort of the literary James Bond, the Fleming Bond, as opposed yeah. to some of the, the 1980s Bond incarnations. So, yeah. yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess around 14, 15. That's a, that's a good age, isn't it, for, for Bond, mm. especially when it comes to reading the books as well. I, I remember there was a little charity shop down the end of my street, and uh, I remember going in there one day and seeing all those old sort of like crinkled up paperbacks <laughs> from Fleming back in the day. I mean, like, whoa, and they were they were like 80p each or something crazy. Oh. And I remember, you know, getting the whole set and just pouring through them. And it, I, I must have been about, yeah, some of 12, 13 or 14 at that point. Oh, that so, great. Yeah, what a, what a beauty. And Majesties, what a great book. Uh, question number three. Who is your favourite Bond girl? Now, I know you know a lot of them, so you've got to be a little bit political in your answer here, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's, you see, Roger always used to say to me, whenever he was asked that question, he wouldn't give an answer simply because if I was to say, say, Britt Eklund, for instance, mm. then Lord Adams, if she saw this, would email me and say, well, what's wrong with me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's difficult. So I'll, 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 I'll sort of decline, but I will mention Britt Eklund in there. All right. Okay. Very nice. Absolutely cool. Uh, question number four then, and I, I feel like this one is a is an absolute shoe in. I don't even really need to ask the question, but number four, who is your favourite Bond actor? Bond actor. Now, the, mm. oh, let me think about that. Um, well, I mean, I have to say Roger Moore because I grew up with him. I really did. I mean, it was one of those things. I'm not just saying it because I work for the guy, but mm. he was my Bond, and you know, to to be 
in the 80s watching him on the big screen uh, that was fantastic so yeah he was my bond yeah absolutely because i suppose then a, a good follow up question will be who would be your second favorite bond after roger um i have to be sean connery wouldn't it because he really created the role he defined the role his early films are fantastic and i think they still stand up really well so yeah and and you know he, he is i think a quintessential bond i mean okay daniel craig is the bond of the generation but i think there's always this argument that sean connery was the first and therefore yeah. is up there good stuff excellent answer number five if you can possibly narrow it down what is your all-time favorite bond scene now i know there's scene. a lot to choose from it's a crazy one but uh, just to Ooh. illustrate my own i i my favorite scene in the whole series is the end of Casino Royale, where he finally says his name. Um, You know, he shot Mr. White in the leg. There's something magical about that scene that just gets me every time. So what's your equivalent of that, if you have one? Gosh, that's tough. Um, I think The Spy Who Loved Me, the the opening for me, you know, the ski jump, because that not only sets up the movie, you know, it really reinforces that Bond is back. And this is a guy with such charm, charisma, and ash. And a guy who can basically do any stunt you want, even skiing backwards. So yeah. that scene, you know, for me is magical. That is a beauty, isn't it? I suppose it's one of those things, isn't it? When you think about it, when, like you were just saying about Sean, he, you know, invented the role and all the rest of it. And you had, you know, Bond mania back in the 60s. And then it could so easily, when you when you, the next fella or the next fella takes over the role, it's so easy that it could just sort of trickle away and just be a, a shadow of what it once was. But that film, really did reinvent it for the 70s didn't it and it, it really so. became its its own thing and roger owned it from that, mm, that point onwards what a, what a beauty of a opening scene that's a great choice uh next up then uh question number six what is your earliest memory of bond earliest memory well it would be going to the cinema when i was four to see the spy who loved me and discovering yeah. this whole new world and uh yeah. i'm sorry to keep harking back to it but you know for a young four-year-old going to the cinema i used to go to the cinema all the time i mean from when i was a baby in arms but yeah. going to see this film that was just so very different to anything else i'd ever seen you know yeah. it, it was a whole new world opening up to me so that that was my earliest memory beautiful uh, that's a, a great one as well um what would you say is question number seven what would you say is a bond location that you've not been to but you would love to visit the most Poor. Cortina in Italy. Oh, yeah? Uh, beautiful place. Uh, where else would I like to go? Gosh. Um, San Francisco, I'd love to go. I've never been there. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, Swindon. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, I mean, there have been so many over the years, haven't there? Um, the Caribbean, I think, Jamaica. I've never been to Jamaica. Yeah, that's a that's a beauty. Do you know all three of those that you've just mentioned are all ones that I've not been to myself, so we're we're oh. in a similar boat there. But yeah, I think uh, I think Jamaica has to be a, a mm. magical spot, isn't it? You know, with with yeah. that's the birthplace of the whole thing. Being able to sit at that desk, you know, and just drink in that atmosphere must be crazy. Yeah. But uh, okay, then final quick fire question before we uh, we go a little bit deeper. Then question number eight: What is the most Bond like thing you have ever done? Cool. Um, <laughs> gosh, um, that's really tough because I, what's the most bond like thing? I've driven an Aston Martin with Jeremy Clarkson driving, actually. I was in the passenger That'll seat. Do. That was quite fun. Yeah. Um, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. That was fun. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. You've got to tell that story. How did that happen? Well, no, they were filming an episode of Top Gear at Pinewood. And they had the Aston Martin Volante there parked outside, just outside my office, and he was filming. And I just went down to say hello and got chatting. And um, he said, do you want to have a ride? I said, yeah, okay, fine. And he just drove me around the studio. So it's nice. quite a bizarre, <laughs> bizarre thing to happen, but great fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what type of Aston Martin was it? It was the Volante from Living Daylights. Lanto for the daylight. It's very nice. Cool. All right. Sweet. Good stuff. So then let's talk about the book, Raising an Eyebrow, yes. My Life with Sir Roger Moore. So yes. this book is kind of like your memoirs of working with Sir Roger, obviously. And it's, yeah. it's it, it, what prompted, was it something you always thought you would do one day or was it somebody else no. said, Gareth, you have to do this? No, I never thought I'd do it. Um, uh, because, you know, when you work for someone, it, it's a relationship that you don't necessarily talk about, you know, there's mm. 
you know, any boss client relationship can be quite confidential. And, and I have huge respect for him. So I'd never want to do anything that would in any way sully his sort of reputation or his, yeah. his, his sort of legacy. Um, but I did start writing down some notes because last year um, there was the possibility of doing a documentary film. Right. And that's still hopefully on the cards. And Sanjeev Baskar, my friend, is hopefully still going to write and direct it. But we were in a period where we were between meetings. We had meetings with BBC, meetings with Sky. And I just thought, well, it might be helpful for him as a scriptwriter to have some stories. So I started writing down stories of how I sort of got to work with Roger and the things we'd done. And it was strange because I just sort of kept writing and writing and writing, really enjoyed it. Yeah. And before I knew it, I had something like 150 pages. And I showed it to my friend Robin Harbour, who always proofreads my stuff. And I said, Robin, you have a look at this. What do you think? And he says, is it a new book? And I said, well, no, it's not really a new book. It's sort of my notes for a documentary. And he said, no, no, I, this is a book. And I, and I thought, really? Okay, fine. And, and, and I sort of read it back, and I thought, I've actually subconsciously written it, almost yeah, like yeah. writing a book. And I, I thought, well, it's going to be useful for me in the future because it will remind me of all the fun because memory fades and sometimes you don't quite remember all the bits and pieces. Yeah. And I was finishing a book. I was finishing John Richardson's book at the time with the History Press. And the editor, Mark Bainan, uh, I just mentioned this. I, was, I said, you know, I've written some stuff down. Uh, and he said, can I, can I have a read of some of it? So, yeah, sure. Okay, fine. So I sent him a few, I don't know, maybe 20 pages. And he said, can I read the rest? Oh, okay, fine. Sent it through to him. And he said, um, how long do you need to finish it and polish it up? Right. I said, well, I don't know. Why? He said, well, we'd like to publish it and we'd like to publish it in February. Now this was around, I guess, March, April last year, something like that. So I said, well, when do I have to deliver it? And he said, two months. I said, okay, two months. So I literally polished it up and, you know, got it to where it is now in, in about two months flat. And yeah, it was one of those, things that sort of came out of nowhere i never intended to write it it just happened and, yeah. and i'm pleased yeah. it did because you know hopefully everybody is quite enjoying it and seeing another side of roger which is, which is yeah yeah <laughs> big time i tell you i i read it cover to cover in two sittings i i loved it so much it was it's one of those things where i i, I know i'm really enjoying a book if i start saying things out loud you know and i'm like no way or i'm laughing out loud there are so many stories in there that just had me absolutely crying with laughter it's a it's a great uh, great book but i'll ask you about some of those stories in a little bit but uh so what what was it that sort of like i know obviously you tell some of these stories in the book anyway but for the benefit of the podcast we'll, we'll talk about them here but um so what was it that that kind of first got you into this industry in this world the film industry oh god well i was doing my um undergraduate degree at university of bangor in north wales and quite I mean, quite different to anything else. It was applied physics. So I've got a degree in applied physics. Um, but I, I'd been to Pinewood in 1990, and it was deserted. It was like a ghost town. Everything yeah. was looking really run down and tired. And I just thought to myself, you know, why is the British film industry in the doldrums? You know, why aren't we making films? And I think it was 1994. We'd made something like 15 films in the UK that year. And I thought, well, this is crazy. You know, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, we were making 50, 60, 70 movies a year. Mm. And it was really through that, really, through my frustration, I suppose, getting to ask questions and um, contacting politicians and putting together some research material. I got to know the managing director of Pinewood, Steve Jaggs. And I decided to try and showcase the best of British film because it's all very well banging on about it. But what's the point in sort of saying we need more films if you don't actually say, look, this is what we've done, this is what we're capable of doing. So I yeah. put on a big event in North Wales, a weekend of British film at a big theatre, some celebrity guests along, and I got a lot of publicity. And I think it was uh, Film Review magazine back then. Uh, they said to me, okay, you've done this, we've done a report on it, what's next? And I said, well, I think I'd like to do something similar at Pinewood. I'd like to open up Pinewood to the to the public and to the press and to show them the fantastic facilities. Yeah. And just really sort of hammer the drum. And, and so I went to see Steve Jaggs and I said, look, how about doing an open day and showcasing some movies and doing a tour around the studio, getting people in, getting press in. And he looked at me as though I started raving mad. I mean, I was 20, 21 then, and asking this guy to give me the keys to the studio. 
But he, you know, I have to say, in all honesty, he said to me, you know what, go away, write a proposal, uh, and let's talk. So I suggested doing a, a sort of a day, British Film Day at Pinewood, and we set a date, April the 9th, 1994. And Steve said, okay, you know, I'll support you in anything you want to do. Uh, go ahead and do it. And that's we opened up the studio to the to the public. We opened up the studio, got the press in, got some cars and film stars in, and, and just really banged the drum. And, and that, yeah. I suppose, where I got in subconsciously. I mean, a totally bizarre way in. And on the back of that, I was approached by a guy who is now managing director of Lionsgate UK, a guy called Ziggy Kamasa. And he was running a computer company in Uxbridge and similar sort of age. And he said, look, I, I, I've got a bit of money. I know nothing about the film industry, but I've always rather fancied getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, you seem like a guy who knows everything. Can we get together, have a chat? So I said, yeah, sure. I went to meet him and he said, OK, what do we do? And I said, well, I'm about to graduate. Uh, wouldn't it be a great idea if we set up a production company and moved into Pinewood? And he said, OK, um, I'll, I'll put some money into that. You put the expertise into it, and we'll do it. And it just it just happened that way. It was quite okay. bizarre. So I found myself in Pinewood. I think it was August 1994. I opened an office there, and I'm still there now. How crazy! That's that's a, a wonderful thing that you you just literally put this whole thing together off your own back. There was nobody else, sort of, you know, just a little kernel of an idea in your in your mind that you just put this event yeah. on, and then that kind of guided your whole path for years later. It's crazy. Know, I had great. I mean, I wrote to a lot of actors because I, you know, I, I said, look, I'm a 21 year old physics student. I stand no chance whatsoever of making any progress in this yeah. world trying to drum up British film industry publicity, as it were. I said, mm -hmm. but if you'll support me and you'll get behind me, that will give me some credibility. And I had yeah. loads of celebrities writing back to me saying, absolutely. You know, people like John Cleese, uh, there was Anthony Hopkins, Jeremy Irons, Emma Thompson, Julie Walters, Bob Hoskins. I mean, just loads and loads of people. And on the back of that, I could drum up more publicity. You know, this young guy from North Wales, all of a sudden, is having lunch with Anthony Hopkins to discuss. Mm. And, uh, you know, that, that, that was great. And, and, you know, it was a fantastic way into the film business. And it was at that time, actually, um, I went to sort of careers day at university, and they said, right, you're about to graduate. Have you thought about what you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I've got this idea, the film industry. And they said, no, no, no. Graduates of physics, you've got two options. You either stay on and do an MSc or you become a teacher. Right. And that, <laughs> I sort of ran. I thought, no, no, no. I really do not want to go into academia. I'm sorry. It's, it's a fascinating career for many as it is. It yeah. wasn't for me. So, uh, yeah. Quite Those – those careers people at, at school and college and all that kind of stuff, they don't uh, tend to think outside the box all that much, do they? It's all very, you know, stick to the path kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I just saw myself <laughs> thinking, oh, God, you know, I'm going to end up with a mortgage, a pension plan, uh, you know, two weeks holiday every year. Uh, no, it's not for me. I, I didn't want that sort of lifestyle. I didn't want that yeah. sort of career. And uh, I suppose, you know, going into the film business, you're not guaranteed any success. You're not guaranteed any income. You know, you're living week to week. And yeah. it was very tough. I mean, for a couple of years, I was worried about paying the rent every week. But, you you know, if you're passionate, you somehow find a way. Yeah, absolutely. So one so, of the things I, I mentioned before when I'm reading a book, and if I find I'm making loud noises while I'm reading, I know I'm enjoying the book and it's a good book. And one of the things that made me go, no way, was when I got to the chapter that uh, told the story of you that you used to live with General Gogol, of all people. <laughs> Walter, like, yeah. <laughs> so t tell us about that. Oh, God. well, he came to my British film day at Pinewood because we were showing from Russia with love. And I thought that was a Bond film that really showcased Pinewood. It really was or is one of the best. Mm. And I wrote to some cast members and said, would you come along on the day? And you know, Eunice Gason came along and Walter Cattell came along. And, you know, Walter, during lunch, he sort of said to me, um, this is my wife, Celeste. She writes for the Daily Express and she'd like to write a little story. Mm. I said, OK, fine. And he said, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm almost 21. And he looked at me and he said, you're, you're only 20? I said, yeah. And you've done all this? I said, yeah. My God. He said, and you're interested in production? I said, yeah. And he said, well, I've got this script and I've been trying to get this going for a little while. Um, perhaps we can have a chat. I said, yeah, okay, fine. He said, well, next time you're down in London, we'll have dinner. Uh, come to my flat. Um, we'll have a chat. So I did. I mean, I took him up on the invitation. and. He gave me the script. It wasn't a great script, I have to say. And and then when I graduated, I told him, I said, look, I'm coming down. I'm moving into Pinewood in August. I'll be down full time. 
uh, perhaps we can get together and discuss a bit more about how I might get this, uh, you know, help you get this going. And he said, well, where, where will you live? And I said, well, I haven't really thought about it. There's, you know, uh, there's a B and B just up the road from Pinewood. I'm going to move in there for a couple of weeks, and then maybe look around. You know, get a little studio flat or something like that. And he said, well, I've got a, a you know, we've got a, a spare room here in the, in the flat. It's a big, big flat. I mean, when I say flat, it's like a four bedroom mansion in right. Victoria right. or Westminster. And he said, would you be interested in renting a room? Renting, okay. Uh, so how much? Um, and he said, fifty quid a week. And the room, I mean, the room was huge. I mean, it's probably bigger than most people's houses. I mean, it was a huge room. Yeah. And and so yeah, I moved in, and I was his lodger for a year. So it was <laughs> quite. That's well. not that's not bad rent for Westminster, is it? Let's be honest. Yeah. All yeah, right. Good then. stuff. Cool. So, what, so did did uh, did Walter make a good good roommate? Was he uh, was he fun to be around? You know, he was fun. He he, he did like the odd. Um, drink and uh quite often if i came in you know he, he thrust a glass of scotch in my hand i can't stand scotch and he'd say sit down how's it all going how's it going you know have you got my money together yet for the film yeah. and you know we had we had a few disagreements because he was one of these guys who believed what was written was the final draft you know this is it won't budge whereas i knew i mean as novice as i was i knew some parts of the script weren't right the director who he'd signed up Kevin Connor said to me, "Look, I only agreed to do this because he, he's a mate, and I thought he'd never get a, you know, never get this film off the ground." Yeah. Uh, so I, I've sort of lent my support to it, never thinking it would go anywhere. And now I'm getting worried. If you're thinking it might get going, we need to work on the script. Yeah. So we had a few discussions, and but you know, he was great fun because Celeste was the food critic uh, for the Daily Express, as well as being a writer uh, in other areas of the Express. And every Friday, I think it was, she had masses of food delivered. So one week she'd be doing, say, articles on apple pie. And she'd have, have apple pie from Marks and Spencer's, from Waitrose, from the co-op, from Tesco, from Asda, from Sainsbury. So you'd walk into the kitchen and there'd be all these apple pies everywhere. And she'd take a slice out of each one and then say to me, you know, do you want some? You want to take some to the studio? Help yourself. So, you know, the apple pies one week, the next week it might be sausages. The week after that, it might be pork pies. The week after that, it might be ice cream. And, you know, it was just like Friday night was this sort of Aladdin's cave of food. You never knew what you'd quite walk into. So that, that was fun. You know, that was fun with him. And, uh, you know, he he was a nice guy. He was a generous guy, a um, bit stuck in his ways and a bit argumentative at times. Yeah. But, you know, to sit down and just talk about films he'd made and talk about people he'd worked with, it, it, it was great fun. Interesting. So you're you're quite the foodie. Every time I see you checking in somewhere on uh, on Facebook, it's always eating something in in some some far off place. So is that where that all started for you? Very rarely, I have to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got a sweet, and um, yeah, I mean it's you know to have a nice meal with friends in good company is something I really love. Um, yeah. I'm not, you know, if somebody says, what do you want to do for your birthday? Do you want a big party? I said, no, no, no. I'd rather just have a nice little meal with a few friends. That's, that's me. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always enjoyed food. I've always enjoyed good food. And, uh, you know, Celeste used to send me off to the studio pretty much every week with a, with a load of food in the, in the bag. Uh, nice. Apart from when she was reviewing wine, when she did wine and spirits, Walter never let a drop leave the house. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I can imagine. I've keep uh, meaning to to make it across to uh, Hush. Obviously, the more ah. family restaurant. I've not made it there yet, but uh, but any any dishes on the menu there that you uh, particularly recommend? Uh the chips, uh, the fries. Yeah. The, they call them the Aspen fries, which I think are uh, three times cooked fries with shavings of truffle. Wow. All right. Lovely. Cool. Well, hey, when. Hey, uh, hey. Yeah, very nice. When uh, when this whole thing blows over, I will uh, I'll make sure I make the uh, the yeah. trip, and I will I will get the chips. Um, so there's okay. So there's interesting. So you 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 had your office at Pinewood. You you're kind of doing this this work after after your event and trying to drum up money for Walter and all this kind of stuff. So you're you're now in the sort of the sphere of Pinewood and yeah. all the rest of it. So at that point, did did Roger have an office at Pinewood at that point? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Roger has an office there going back to 1971. Right. And he was in the main admin building in the main corridor. So quite often on the way to the mailroom, I'd walk past the office and his secretary, Doris Briggs, uh, she was there. I mean, I never dared to knock on the door and go in. Yeah. But I, you know, I did occasionally see Doris in the corridor and I say, hello, good morning. And she said, oh, hello, good morning. 
So we were on nodding terms, as it were, and uh, and that was that was quite nice. And I always hoped that one day I might walk past his office and he might just stumble out and yeah. say hello. Uh, it never quite happened that way. So you, he was at this, even at this point he was a proper hero of yours. Then it wasn't just you know oh, somebody yeah. that you knew of a, a real hero. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I had all of his films. Um, I loved him in interviews, you know, when he did shows like Parkinson and Wogan. I loved it because he was so funny and so self-deprecating and very witty. And yeah. I loved that. And I thought, you know, life's too short. You can't take life too seriously. And uh, and he didn't. And this was the fun thing. He would, he would always try and turn something into fun. And I thought, well, that's not a bad philosophy to have. Mm. Um, and so I, I suppose I tried to have fun along the way and uh, have little jokes now and again. And it does make life easier. It does make the, go, the day go a bit quicker. So big time. Um, yeah, that's, that's a big hero. That's a cool thing. I think it, it, it's one of the things I love about Roger so much is is that he was just genuinely such a good bloke, you know. And it's like there's so many of these actors and stuff out there that just you, you know if you were to you know, sit down and have a drink with them for an hour or so, you know, they're not the nicest people in the world. You know what I mean? And you, you, as much as you can admire their work or whatever, you know, but you look at Rog and you just, what a, what a wonderful guy he was. There was that story after he passed away um, of the kid in the airport, which I'm sure you've, you know, you've heard a million times over. And it's just like little stories like that. You're like, I feel like those people who are genuinely good hearted souls need to be celebrated as much as possible because they're, they're rare, aren't they? In the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And you know, he would always give his time, even if it was just to sign an autograph or to say hello. Yeah. And I, you know, later on when I got to know him very well, I would say to him, look, you don't realize those 20 seconds of your life have just stayed with that person for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And he said, now I said, seriously, they're going to walk away, never forgetting the day they met Roger Moore. Yeah. And he's, oh, you're a wanker. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, you know, he he did. I mean, he always made time. He would never sort of say to people, go away, uh, leave yeah. me alone. Um, and I think, you know, to, to have someone so genuine like that and so so kind, you know, he was kind. If he could yeah. make something happen, he'd make it happen. And he'd always give his time for charity. So, yeah, he was a really good guy. What a man, what a man. So how, how did the job actually end up coming about then? So you're in Pinewood, you've got an office down there, down, you know, in the next building or whatever. Roger's got his office there. You're on nodding terms with his assistant. Like what, what's the, what's, where does it come um, from? I, you know, it's interesting. When you have to pay the rent, you tend to do a lot of different things, uh, legal. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Um, I gave it all that up a long time ago. Um, no, I, 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 made a, I made a film with a young friend of mine uh, who I got to know through, not through college, but through a film festival. He was a, a budding young filmmaker, and I, was, I found myself on the jury of this film festival, Young People's Film Festival. And he came for a couple of years, and one year gave me a script, and he said, I've got this script. I'd like to make it. I'd like to be the UK's youngest ever film director. And can you help me? So I, 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 I helped him get the money together. And his name's Edgar Wright. And, you know, he's gone on to do Shaun of the Dead and, mm. uh, you know, all those sort of films. And he's done very well. Um, never returns my call. Um, <laughs> but it was really between film projects, trying to earn a bit of money to pay the rent is tricky. Mm. I found myself reading a, um, a film industry magazine, uh, all about studios and production. And I thought, well, this is quite interesting. Maybe I could write an article. So I contacted the editor and I said, you know, you're looking for any articles because I'm at Pinewood and maybe I can write a sort of a making of or, a, you know, on location with type story. And he said, yeah, you know, we pay 20p a word, you know, write me a three, four page article. I'll pay you a few hundred quid. How does that sound? I said, great. Fantastic. So I did a couple of reports, you know, on set, the making of type things. And I did that, I suppose I did that over about two or three years, paid quite nicely. And then I sort of found myself doing that, you know, talking to people. All these stories were coming out, and I'd meet people at Pinewood in the bar who were working on a film, and they start telling me all these fascinating stories about, you know, oh, in the 1960s I did this film and I did that film. And, and I thought, crikey, there's a great history here. And I know there's a long-winded answer, but I thought there's a great history here because it needs to be the story of Pinewood through the eyes of the people who made the movies. So I announced to Steve Jaggs, the managing director, that I wanted to write a book. And he said, oh, right, okay. Uh, he said, well, look, I'll give you anything apart from money. Uh, so if you want to do it, go ahead. You know. 
And so I did. I wrote the Pinewood story. I interviewed, I think, around about 100 people. And then on the back of that, I wrote another book and another book. And then I think it was my fourth book, which I wrote with a friend from Germany. Um, we were both Roger Moore fans. And he said, look, there hasn't been a decent book on Roger's career. And he said, there have been a, you know, one or two books, but years ago. And how about we write a book, you know, Roger Moore, his films and career? Yeah. Okay, fine. Sounds interesting. So I actually approached Doris, his uh, secretary. And by that time, I got to know her because she'd read my Pinewood book and she really enjoyed it. And so I got, you know, got more and more friendly with her. We'd have a chat and I'd pop down, pop my head around the door occasionally. And I said to her, you know, I'd like to write this book. Uh, what do you think? And she said, well, Roger will never bless it. He's always resisted authorised biographies. He, he just won't give you the blessing. And I said, well, I'm not asking him to bless it, but would you maybe, when I've done a draft, would you maybe read it for accuracy? And she said, yeah, I'd, I'd do that. It's fine, I'll do that. And so every time I wrote three or four chapters, I'd send them to Doris and she'd make a few notes and she'd send them back. And it was quite strange in a way we sort of became pen pals in that she'd leave a note for me in my pigeonhole saying, by the way, did you know this, dot, 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 and tell me a little story. And, uh, and it was when I completed that draft, she asked Roger to read it. And he said, no, I'm not going to bless it. You know, I'm not going to give you my sort of authority, if you like. And she said, just read the bloody draft. So he read it and he said, yes, yes, that's rather nice. Oh, yeah. And this sort of coincided with her wanting to retire because she'd been with him 29 years and she was then in her mid seventies. She's still around. I saw her a few weeks ago. She's in her mid nineties and um, she's great. And, you know, I was just in the office one day and I said, Oh, I'm so sorry, Doris, that you're going end of an era. You know, it's so sad. And I just sort of jokingly said to her, you know, remember I'm available if, if you ever need a replacement. And she didn't say anything. And then about a week later, she phoned me and said, uh, I'm leaving on the 5th of April. That's been decided. Roger has accepted it reluctantly. He wants me to keep the office open and said that he'd like me to find somebody to replace myself. And uh, I suggested the only person for the job is you. Do you want the job? And I, I mean, God, I, I nearly fell over. I said, what? She said, do you want the job? I said, well, what do I need to do? She said, nothing. Do you want the job? I said, well, yes, okay. She said, well, come and see me next time you're in the studio and I'll talk you through it. So I went to see her. And I said, well, what, what's the interview process? She said, no, there is no interview. I've talked to Roger. I've explained uh, who you are. I've told him that you know a lot about the film industry, you know about production, you know about the fan world. He likes mm -hmm. your book. And he thinks you'd be a very interesting choice. So do I. So do you want the job? I said, yes, okay. She said, right, okay. Uh, you need to talk money. You need to speak to his accountant. He's a horrible man, but uh, you need to speak to him. And that's really how it happened. I mean, it's quite bizarre, isn't it? But it, it just wow. happened. That's similar to how Roger got the job with Bond, isn't it? He just kind of like fell yeah. into it and they, there was no screen test or anything for him, was there? It just, uh, well, that, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you know, I, I half expected her to say there are two or three people for the job and he wants to talk to you. But no, it was a straight case of, do you want the job right? You start on the 6th of April. Um, so, I mean, I did. I, she gave me his email address, and I did introduce myself and sent a rude joke. And, uh, <laughs> and that, that was quite nice. So, you know, he, he, he immediately welcomed me, and he said, right, you know, welcome to the team. And on my first day, I, I, I sat at the desk. and Because Doris always said to me, look, I, I let him phone me. She said, because quite often, you'll find he's in the middle of doing something if you phone him and he can't really talk. So she said, I always let him phone me, and I know then he's available to talk. So every right. morning he would phone in and talk about what needed doing, what was happening, you know, is there anything in the diary, what we need to do. And, yeah, he phoned me up the first morning and welcomed me, and um, I said, oh, I've had this offer in, this letter's arrived from Italy for you to do a, a, talk, uh, a chat show. He said, I don't like Italian TV. It goes on forever. I said, well, you know, they're offering a quite a bit of money. Oh, how much? I think it was 30,000 euros. And he said, oh, no, I don't want to do it. I said, why? He said, well, I've got nothing to talk about. He said, Italian chat shows get you there at six in the evening and that you're there at midnight. They just sit you on a sofa and carry on recording. He said, I've done them before. I've got nothing to talk about. I don't really want to do it. So thank them very much and have a nice day. And that was it. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's just turned down thirty thousand euros. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Craziness. But yeah, that was that was my first day. And and of course, you know, I was sort of tidying up the office, getting everything sort of filed. Because Doris bless her, she never had a computer. She was she had a typewriter and a fax machine. Wow. So uh, you know, I had to get broadband installed, which was, you know, quite amazing. I think I was on dial up by back then for a while because I couldn't get broadband installed for a long time. Um so yeah, it was quite interesting sort of bringing the office into the new century, as it were. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Roger was a prolific emailer, so I, I definitely needed to have a computer and broadband. So, what, so what year was this? Uh, two thousand. Well, it was end of two thousand and one when I was offered the job, and I started it in April two thousand and two. April two thousand and two. How crazy! So, what what was a, a day in the life of Gareth Owen working under Sir Roger? Then, what kind of what kind of what was your day to day stuff? Um, well, you know, I always like to get in the office early, so I'd always be in between about eight and eight thirty. I'd always done that. A Pinewood, because um, I always like to get in before the phone started ringing, because then you can sort of check your mail, you can do whatever you need to do, yeah. and not worry about being interrupted. So I'd always get in early. I'd check the emails, pick up the post, uh, check any messages, any faxes back then, and make a list of things to discuss with Roger. And then when he phoned through, we'd have a chat, sometimes for 20 minutes, sometimes for half an hour, sometimes for two minutes, you know, if he was in a rush. I'd run through, um, talk about what was coming up, in the week or so for, with his diary, uh, any requests from UNICEF, uh, any contact from his agent. Sometimes, you know, we'd have scripts come through or availability checks. And we just run through things. And, you know, sometimes we just chat about the weather, chat about where he was going for lunch. And, um, you know, just sort of chewed the cut, as it were. And uh, yeah. no two days were the same, I have to say, because when he was traveling, I quite often didn't hear from him very often. I might just get a two-minute phone call. Uh, and particularly when he, was, when he was with UNICEF, you know, I wouldn't hear much. But I just keep the office ticking over, deal with any inquiries, let people know he was away, not to worry, deal with his family, and just keep in contact with his accountant and his uh, publicist in America and his agents. And yeah, it's just a very day, really. Yeah, interesting stuff. So uh, just going back to what you said before about that effect that you would have on people, you know, just 10 seconds of Roger's attention is something somebody will treasure forever. And uh, I have to tell my story. I have to thank you first, because obviously it was you that uh, hooked us up with Sir Roger for our interview with him on JBR a few years back. And uh, I've always said, if you could have seen my face when your message popped up in my inbox, I, I remember you said, would you have time to speak to Sir Roger for 20 minutes uh, in the run-up to the tour? And if you could have seen my face and, and seen me sort of collapse in a heap on the floor, you would have you'd have laughed yourself silly. But uh, I remember that morning when uh, we did the interview, We I think it was 10 o'clock in the morning, we were, we were kind of booked in to talk to him. And you'd given me his Skype address. And I remember the little profile photo on the Skype address is the My Word is My Bond cover where, where he's got the, the uh, director's chair where he's leaning over the back of it with 007 written on it. And I'm like, I'm I'm friends with Roger on Skype. This is the craziest thing. And uh, and I remember 10 o'clock came and, and he didn't pop up. And I thought, okay, let's give him five minutes. He's probably, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then by quarter past 10 came, Chris and I are sitting there on Skype and still know Sir Roger, still showing us offline on Skype. So I dropped you a text and I said, he's, you know, he's not showing up. And he said, leave it with me. Give me two minutes. And then sure enough, a minute later, boom, it pops up and says, Roger Moore is online. And then he starts calling me. And it was just this, this, thing in the middle of my screen saying Roger Moore is calling you dot 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 and the, my computer's ringing and I just had, I sat there for a moment I'm like holy shit oh, do I, do I out or do I hang up yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it was just it was such a, a crazy moment and I, I remember I can't remember whether I've told you this story before but I remember when I answered he was on his iPad and he'd obviously the reason he was late I think he was I think he was just sitting up in bed reading the paper or something yeah I think and, that's uh, what because I, I, I phoned him and I said you're doing an interview on Skype aren't you he said oh, fuck uh, so <laughs> One of those situations where, yeah, you know, he's probably engrossed yeah. in the Daily Telegraph or something, and then realised. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing. But there was, uh, but yeah, when when he first answered, he didn't. His webcam was on, and I think he, did, he didn't realise, and he was literally sitting there in his bathrobe, hair all over the place, looked like he just rolled out of bed, and uh, and it, his eyes went all wide, and all of a sudden the camera went off, and I, I obviously didn't mention anything. I just said hi and stuff, and uh, I always said it, it was like my. My personal moment, like at the end of Moonraker, you know, where M calls him and he's in a in a tight spot and and all the rest of it. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I, I will always always treasure that memory. But what oh, what, what a man! What a man! What a yeah, because he, he used to like to laze around in the mornings, read the papers, 
And, yeah. um, you know, if he didn't have to get up, he'd love, you know, watch breakfast TV in bed, have breakfast in bed and read the papers. That was his treat. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was always, sometimes he didn't realize the camera was on. And, uh, and there's a very funny story. I don't know if I can tell it, actually. His wife, Christina, bless her, I saw her about three weeks ago. And she just came out of the shower, obviously, and walked into his office. And he was on the Skype to me on video right. call. Right. And he, he went, darling, I'm on camera. She went, ah! And she ran out. He said, did you see that? I said, no, I never saw a thing. He said, good. I said, she's not a natural blonde, is she? And, uh, <laughs> nice. and, uh, it was great fun, great fun. Good, what a legend. Um, so what did you, for you then, for somebody who, you know, somewhat, you know, like a lot of us listening to this right now, huge fans of Sir Roger. He was a legend to you even when you were a kid growing up, a real hero to you. When you start working for somebody like that, does does that feeling ever go away? You know, like for me, when it's like, when it says on my computer screen, Roger mm. Moore is calling you, and I I just have this bizarre like, what planet am I living on right now moment? And then you get yeah. this job working. Does does that movie star thing ever go away? Or, or not or really? Because no. you you were I mean, good friends we, with him, weren't you? Yeah, we we became great friends. And um, you know, when you work with someone, it's a very different relationship because. You know, I could sit there fawning all over him saying, oh, my God, this is Roger Moore. He doesn't want that. You know, he wanted mm. somebody to be professional, to handle anything that needed doing swiftly and and to be there, you know, just to be on the end of the phone. And, yeah, you know, sometimes he'd phone up and if there was somebody in the office. So I think in the book I mentioned, um, sorry, I'm just going to pull this forward because I've got a bit of light shining on my head. I, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, I mentioned there was a DHL driver, I think, came into the office. and. Um, Roger said, who have you got there? I said, oh, it's a delivery driver. What, is he delivering money for me? I said, no, I don't think so. I think he's stationary. Oh, um, and, the, and the DHL driver was sort of standing there. He recognized the voice and was obviously thinking, who is this? And Roger said, tell him to come around where I can see him on Skype. So the guy walked around, and his face just lit up. And, he, <laughs> and it's moments like that when I'm witness to that. I think, shit, you know, this is Roger Moore. Um, yeah. So it reminds you. So when people have that sort of reaction, it reminds you that, you know, this is a great movie star. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm walking around London with him, you know, the reactions from people, the way they look and they point and they do a double take. Um, yeah, it does remind you that you're with someone very special. And, it, it yeah, it never quite goes away. Yeah. Interesting stuff. So what, do you have a, a personal favorite story from working with him all those years? Gosh. Oof. I'm sure there are so know. many. So many. Um, I mean, just, you know, I remember the first time he invited me to go to Switzerland. He said, well, would you like to come out? I think I've been working for him for about six, seven months. He said, would you like to come out um, to Switzerland, spend a weekend with us? I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, I'd love that. He said, right, well, book yourself a ticket, cheap. And uh, and he said, what you do, you fly to Geneva. And then he said, you go downstairs at the airport, get on the train to Sierra. And then when you get to Sierra, which is about two hours from Geneva, I'll meet you. And, and I just remember getting off the train in Sierra and him standing there waving across to me. And I just thought, my God, I can't believe I've come all this way to Switzerland. I'm met at the station by James Bond. And I'm now going up this mountain to a chalet to stay with him for three days. Yeah. And he was the most wonderful host. You know, the room was lovely. Uh, he left a bottle of water next to the bed. He asked me what I like for breakfast. And and he planned, you know, he said, right, for lunch we're going to this restaurant, for dinner we're going here, then tomorrow for lunch we're going here, and then in the evening. And he planned these sort of two, three days to make sure I had a lovely time and I had lovely experiences. And then we'd sit down in the afternoons and just watch a movie together. Um, so I think just, just sort of being with him in a sort of um, – a non-work environment, you know, when we were just being friends. That yeah. was really nice. That was really nice. That was very special. That's a beautiful <laughs> thing, Matt. Like that's totally winning the luck of the draw, isn't it, with a with a boss like that? Because my my missus used to work in that world a little bit, and it's it's it totally depends on who's the one paying the check. Yeah. You know, sometimes they can be lovely people, sometimes they can be really really nasty people. And I've never heard a story like that where it's like, you know, you're literally been invited to stay the weekend and he's the one looking yeah. after you for the weekend, you know. Yeah, and and you know, he phoned me up one day and he, he was writing or he, he said he would write a lecture to deliver at the Nobel Museum. Um I think it was the centenary of Kipling's death. Hmm. He phoned me up in a panic and he said, "Shit, I, he said I've agreed to write this thing." And he said, "I've only really now just read the email." 
And he said, and I have to deliver this 90 minute lecture. He said, Christ, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, this was on the Wednesday. And he said, are you free this weekend? I said, well, I was going to go and visit my mum. No, he said, go and see her next weekend. Get a flight down here. Uh, fly out on Friday. I need you to come down and write this lecture with me. So I said, okay. And I got there on the Friday afternoon. And I, I sort of produced my laptop and I got my notebook. And I said, right, shall we get down to it? He said, look, you've just flown into Nice. You've been busy. Why don't we go have a nice dinner? And I said, oh, well, I thought I'd come here. To... No, he said, there's time for that tomorrow. We'll have a nice dinner first. And we went out for dinner. <laughs> and nice. So even when I was down there to work, he would always say, oh, there's time for that tomorrow. Um, and, and, yeah, you know, many a time I went down there, and the first thing he'd say is, right, I booked a restaurant. Um, so it, work was always a joy. And, and, yeah, you know, sometimes I'd have to sort of change plans and drop things. But you could never refuse him because he was always so nice when he asked. You know, it was always yeah. with mind, and I'm ever so sorry to ask, but would you mind coming down? Or oh, flying to Monaco? Oh, well, what if I have to? <laughs> Crazy stuff. Well, so one of the things that I uh, I kind of enjoy doing is is taking a little piece of of you know somebody I admire's life and, and just kind of like paying tribute to that a little bit. So like with Roger, when it was time for him to kick back and, and relax and stuff, what did he enjoy doing the most? What was, what was, you know, was there any particular drinks or food that he really loved? You know, so next time I can have a little glass of that and think it's a Roger next time. Well, gin martini was his favorite. Oh yeah. That, yeah. Gin martini, ice cold. And um, that was his little treat. He never used to have it a lot, but that was his treat. And, uh, and Sansa white wine, you know, Sansa new vintage. Yeah. Uh, he'd always love. I never drank. I don't drink. I, I, it just doesn't agree with me. So we go to a restaurant and he'd say, oh, I've got this beautiful, beautiful bottle of wine. Would you like a little taste? And I said, well, I'll try it. And I try a bit and I say, oh, God, that tastes so sour. It tastes like vinegar. He said, oh, you're a fucking yeah. Philistine you are. <laughs> um, but I, I, it just never agreed with me. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, Gin martini, white wine, he used to like a Jack Daniels. Um, but, it, you know, he wasn't a big drinker. He, you know, he enjoyed it socially with a meal, but he wouldn't go home and say, right, let's open the bottle. Yeah, uh, yeah. That wasn't his style. You know, he used to just love in the afternoon to have a Magnum ice cream. That was his big treat and watch a movie. A and I watched quite a few movies things. with him. And um, Yeah. Yeah. And, and because he was a member of the Academy, he used to get all the screeners. And so sometimes if I was there, say, in December or January, we'd have the screeners and he'd sit down and he'd talk. And it's interesting because he analysed the films from a director's point of view. He'd talk about the camera work. He'd talk about the lighting yeah. and, and the construction of a scene. And I thought, this is fascinating to be sitting here with him. You know, I just watch a movie and say, I enjoyed that. That was good. Good acting, good script. But he'd say, did you see the lighting in that scene? The way, oh, and, he said, and the camera work. He said, that's and it's quite interesting from a technical point of view to sit there and watch that with him. So, yeah, you know, his big treat was a movie, a magnum ice cream, and in the evenings if he could have beans on toast or a pork pie and watch some comedy on TV, that 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 was what he loved to do to, to chill out. Beautiful, a man of a man of simple taste. Next time I have a magnum, I will uh, I will think of Siraj. So he used to, he didn't he direct some episodes of the Persuaders and stuff over the years. Yeah, he did quite a few episodes of the Saint. I uh, did a couple of episodes of The Persuaders, and he was going to direct a movie or two, but it was a case of, at that time, timing. Yeah. Because he'd say, you know, as an actor, going in to do a movie, you're on it six weeks, maybe ten weeks, and then you go home. As yeah. a director, you're on it for a year because you've got the preparation, you work with the writer, you bring on board the crew, you then shoot the movie, you then edit the movie, you then have the movie scored, and then you're in press and you know, publicity. And he said, so directing takes a hell of a lot of time. And he did want to direct more, but I think, yeah, as I say, with a movie, you've got to commit a year. And mm -hmm. I suppose he was being offered so much stuff that he could make six films in a year as an actor. Yeah. And a lot of money. And he might make one movie as a director. And, you know, if it didn't go well, he didn't get paid much. So, yeah, you know, he, he had a great eye for things. And I wish he directed more, but I think it was just timing, really. Absolutely interesting. So, um, when you you know during the 
the uh, the live show years, as I as I might call them. So it was you and you and your co-star, as you lovingly called him, um, traveling all over the country and giving you know doing the talks in afternoon or an evening with Sir Roger. Um, what was that experience like for you? Was that was that because uh, I imagine that was a new thing for you, wasn't it? Being yeah. Well, um, I, I'd done it once or twice with him for UNICEF because UNICEF had done a couple of fundraising evenings. And they said, would you come up and give a speech? And Roger said, you know, I hate giving a speech at these sort of events. He said, you know, if I'm on a field trip and I'm briefed, I can make a passionate speech because I'll have the presidents there, the prime ministers there. I know exactly what to say to get them into UNICEF. He said, but when I'm asked to give a talk about my life and and sort of talk about movies, he said, Christ, I freeze up. I don't know what to do. So once or twice I interviewed him just to sort of prompt him and nudge him along. Um, when those came along, it was I think it was after Bond on Bond, or at the time Bond on Bond was published, because I, I wrote all of his books with him. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Roger was a fascinating storyteller, but you ask him to write it down, and he said, oh, Christ, I haven't got time for that. I can't be bothered with that. So he just liked to talk, and then I'd go away and type it all up and polish it up. And so when Bond on Bond came out, the um, just before, our, our literary agent said to us, look, I've had this idea. There's a few people doing talks when they do book signings. And that's quite successful because you get more people coming because they think, oh, you know, we're going to go and we'll hear a little story. It's not going to be a two minute sort of meeting and then we leave. And she said, you know, there are a few people even doing theatre gigs whereby you go in and you do an hour and a half and then you do a book signing. How about that? And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. I'll run it by him. So I told Roger, and he said, no, I don't think so. He said, I can't stand up and talk for an hour and a half. He said, God almighty, you know, they'll be bored. And uh, and I said, well, there's a bit of money in it, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he said, well, tell me more. So I, I had our agent um, come on board to have a meeting. And she said, look, I've got these producers, Susanna and Jeremy, they do evenings with type shows. And how about it? And she sort of mentioned the sort of money involved and Roger's eyes lit up and he said, oh, I do like to earn a few quid. That's very nice. And then he looked at me and he said, well, if I'm going to do this, you're going to do it because you'll have to be on stage with me to prompt me and to nudge me and to keep me going. And I said, well, why me? I said, you know, surely somebody like, I said, you like Barry Norman. Barry Norman would be good. He said, yeah, the difference is you let me speak. (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. And so he said, what about it? And I said, well, you know, okay. um, How about a little, you know, compensation? Oh, yes. Um, What do you have in mind? I said, well, let's do a percentage. I said, why don't we do a percentage? I'll take a small percentage of whatever you get. And we had a bit of a negotiation. He said one figure, I said another, and we met in the middle. And uh, he said, right, okay, that's business over with. Let's get on with it. Uh, Where's the first show? And so uh, I think we had seven shows the first year round. And he said, don't tell me what you're going to ask me. I don't want to know, because if you tell me, I'll be sort of anticipating the question. He said, just ask me, and then I will give you a natural answer. Yeah. And I thought, that's all very well for you. You've literally got to walk on stage, sit down, and then look at me and say, right, okay, let's go. Um, But, you know, I thought this is going to be fun. So I just really started, and I thought I'll put a rough timeline together. And we've got to get from A to B in an hour and a half with an interval. And what do people want to hear about? They want to hear about his early career, the saint, the persuaders, getting into Bond, and a little bit about UNICEF. So we we sort of worked out a format, um, very loose format. And, you know, I sat on stage, prompted him, he'd go off telling stories and I'd try and bring him back. And then he'd say to me sometimes, oh, you forgot to ask me. I said, yeah, I did that deliberately because we're running behind. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so and he loved interaction with the audience. He loved audience questions Yeah. because he'd never done it before. I mean, you know, this is a man in his 80s sitting in front of 1,200 or 1,500 people in the palm of his hand. And they all want to ask him a question. And he found it really interesting. He found it very funny yeah. sometimes because some of the questions were quite ridiculous, but some of them really made him laugh. And, yeah. uh, you know, for him, I think that was very special to have an all. You know, when you're in your 80s, you don't expect to work. And when you're an actor in your 80s, you think your best years are behind you. Yeah. And he loved to work. He loved 
to earn a little bit of money, not because he was greedy, but because he would always say, I love the feeling of being able to earn money. I'm in my right. 80s. So I remember when I was broke as a young actor, and that feeling of being able to earn money never goes away. And he said, and I love the fact that I can still work. And so for him, it was very special. And we did it for five years. I think we probably paid, played about 50, 60 theatres over, the, over those five years. And, uh, you know, it was just so exciting for him. Every time he stood in the wings, really nervous. And he sort of pushed me on. And I could see him behind me, you know, when I turned. And he'd sort of be straightening his tie and making sure his hair's all right. Because he was really nervous. Yeah, and he's yeah, like, oh, yeah. this man has been on movie screens. You know, he's worked with some of the biggest names in show business. And he's nervous about walking on to a stage. Uh, but he said to me afterwards, he said, well, you know, if you ever lose that feeling of nerves and adrenaline, then you shouldn't be doing this. So. That's a fair That's a fair, fair comment, I think. That's, I think that might be the, the root of why he was such a lovable guy as well is because obviously like you were saying about the comment about being able to make money and never forgetting what it was like to be broke in his young years and stuff. I, when I was a kid, I always assumed Roger Moore had come from the upper classes and stuff, you know, that big right. voice and the, you know, all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, just coming at a normal sort of working class kid and working his way through was, uh, I guess he never sort of lost that route, no, you know? No, and, yeah. he, he, and he, he knew the value of money as well. Uh, because he could be the most generous man. And if ever there was a lunch, he would never look at the bill. He would just produce his credit card and say, I'm taking care of this. He would yeah. never sort of look at the bill and go, Ooh. so he could be the most generous person. But at the same time, he knew the value of things. And I think it was a story in the book where he arrived in London without his overcoat. And, you know, the weather in the south of France was lovely. It was in the sort of mid 20s. He arrived in London. It was about 14 degrees. And he said, God, I'd come without my overcoat. And I said, oh, right, what can we do? He said, it's all right. He said, it's all right. I'll go to Harrods this afternoon and I'll buy one. He said, you know, they have them off the peg. Said, yeah, I'll buy one. Said, you can always have a new overcoat, always useful. Mm -hmm. And that afternoon he phoned me and I said, oh, did you go to Harrods? Yes, yes, yes. He said, did you get a new coat? No. I said, why? He said, do you know how much they wanted for an overcoat? I said, no, 2,000 fucking quid off the peg, <laughs> 2,000 fucking quid. I said, God, what did you do then? He said, I bought a scarf, 1999. Um, so he appreciated the value of money. He could have easily bought that. You know, yeah, yeah. he couldn't afford it. But he appreciates the value of money. And, and, and I think that was something he always tried to instill in his kids. You know, don't just expect it. You have to work mm. for it. And you need, when you do work for it, you need to plan for a rainy day. And you need to put yeah. your money aside to pay the tax man. You know, don't just earn it and go and spend it. So he was always very careful, and uh, and you know, and you know, he managed to build up a nice pension pot. So why not enjoy your final years living in luxury? Yeah, absolutely. I I would do the same in that uh, in that spot for sure. But yeah, it's funny that with the I, I was at the I think that was the first show, wasn't it? When you guys released My Word Is My Bond, and you were at the South Bank, was that the first show you did? Uh, South Bank was that at the National Theatre or was that the BFI? Yes. The, I think that was a national theatre, if I remember right. No, that wasn't me. That wasn't me, though. That was Emma Forbes, I have to say. That wasn't me. Um, oh. it, yeah. Yeah, she was pretty as she got the job. Um, That's right. Now that rings a bell now. Yeah, I remember her being there now you said that. Um, no, that was when his autobiography came out, My Word Is My Bond. So that was yeah. about four years before. Yeah. And the National Theatre invited him to go, and I think they charged something like £5 a ticket or £10 a ticket. Right. And, and they said, who would you like to interview you? And he... I think at the time he said, well, I don't mind. And they said, well, Emma Forbes does some of these for us. And he says, oh, I know Emma. I know her dad. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah. And uh, I think that was just a one-hour, was it a one-hour shot uh, sort of thing? Really but the audience, that, yeah. I don't think the audience were interacting with him at that point. I think it was just a straight interview. That's right. Uh, that rings a bell now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I saw I saw the show maybe three times, I think, over the years. And uh, right. that was that was my first one. So yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten that that wasn't, that wasn't you. Funny. Um, no, I remember that first moment when I first kind of laid eyes on him. He walks out on the stage, and I, I'd gone with it with a couple of friends. Chris was there, and, and a couple of others. And uh, I remember the moment he walked out on the stage and kind of waved, and everybody's on their feet going going ape shit as they did. And I remember just sort of like looking around and, and sort of looking at everybody in the audience, and everybody without fail just had this this look on their face of just absolute yeah. 
love for the man. You know what I mean? It was like everybody well, became 10 years old again, you know, the moment he walked down the stage. Yeah, I'm just conscious of this light coming down from, oh, uh, look, showing off. Um, <laughs> no, because no, I said to him, I said, look, Roger, you know, you're almost untouchable in a way because, okay, you know, you go to London, you walk around London. And I said, but you're not the sort of actor who appears in a lot of events, live events. You know, you don't mm. appear as a friend of Jimmy Tarbuck at the Palladium or anything like that. Uh, I said, so you're quite untouchable to a lot of these people. And so to come to a venue where you're in the same room is quite special. Yes, 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 of course, yes. Yes, I'm a star, you know, I'd say. Um, <laughs> but I think for audiences to be in the same room as this guy who played Bond, and he would always say there are fewer people who played Bond than walked on the moon. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, there are six actors in the world who play James Bond, and to be in the room at any one time with one of them is, is a you know, a statistic I can't quite imagine. Uh, <laughs> I remember we were in New York, actually, and George Lazenby came. Um, it was a book, it was a talk. Um, uh, the New York film critic was interviewing Roger on stage, and George Lazenby was in the neighbourhood, and he came along, and and Roger knew he was there. And when... He came on stage. He said, before we start, he said, I should just say that, you know, you guys, you're here in the room with James Bond. Well, no, you're not. You're actually in the room with two James Bonds. How about that? And they all turned around and gave Lazenby a round of applause. Yeah. And I said, Roger, why, you know, why did you do that at the beginning? He said, well, I didn't want this guy to say anything disparaging about George. Oh, nice. All right, so that cool. was nice. That yeah. was nice. Yeah. Oh, that is nice. I remember this, the book is littered with little stories like that about him, him just being super thoughtful about, you know, maybe he's at lunch with a journalist. And I remember there was one where you guys were in a, you know, a posh restaurant and the journalist was a bit out of his depth with the menu and didn't know what to order. And Roger just went, ah, oh, I usually just have the cheeseburger or whatever, you know, yeah. just to put the guy at ease and all that kind of stuff. That's, uh, yeah, no, he, that's he, he, and, and that was in New York. And um, the guy who came to interview, he, He's, and, you know, Roger always ate his cheeseburger with a knife and fork. Right. And this guy, being American, sort of looked at him and said, you eat it with a knife and fork? And Roger said, well, how do you eat it? He said, well, I pick it up and go like that. And Roger said, oh, Philistine. Um, <laughs> but, but it immediately helped put this guy at ease. And then Roger said, this is on me. And he said, no, 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 I can't let you pay, because if you pay, it looks like you're influencing the outcome of the interview. Yeah. And Roger said, well, it's going to be a great interview, isn't it? And he said, well, yeah. He said, so there we go. No problem. I'll pay. Uh, so, um, yeah, he was, he was very good at that. And, you know, when we were with our publicists, we'd always be assigned a publicist by the publisher in whichever country we were in. Yeah. 99% of the time, he would always say to the publicist, come and join us for lunch. And the publicist would sort of stare as if to say, ah, well, I'm never invited. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just the guy who gets pushed out, you know, when you go off to a nice restaurant. And Roger said, well, if we're working together all day, we shall have lunch together. Yeah. You know, that, that's the way to do it. Why not? So, uh, yeah, it was nice to see that sort of thing. What a, what a good man. So we're, we're going to the, the sort of tail end of the, of the live show uh, run. Um, I remember reading in the book with the last performance you guys did in 2017, yeah, uh, you'd already decided that was going to be the last show, wasn't it? That was again. I think that was the yeah. South Bank. That was the South Bank. That was the yeah. um, uh, Festival Hall. Uh, you know, nearly two thousand people there. Uh, that was our fifth year of doing it, and we played pretty much. I mean, we'd had a discussion with the producer, and she said, "Look, if you're thinking of doing this next year, we might have to think about coming down." a peg in terms of the size of theatres because we played all the big theatres. We played, you know, 50, 60 theatres, the A-list theatres. Yeah. And Roger said, no, I'm, I, I don't know. If you're going to go out, go out with a bang. Don't go out, you know, turning up at theatres that seat 200 people because yeah. then it was a bit desperate. So he said, well, you know, I'm going to be 90 next year. I don't think I want to be travelling anymore. Because um, touring was really tiring because, you know, one day you'd be in Norwich and the next night you'd be on in Newcastle. And so you've got to come off stage and then get in a car and drive part way to Newcastle and then next morning drive the rest of the way. And when you're doing that day on day, it becomes very tiring, you know, because you're literally mm -hmm. moving from a hotel to the theatre, then from the theatre to a hotel and then on to the next one. Um, and he was sort of saying, I don't think we're going to do any more next year. And I said, well, maybe if they offer you a lot of money, you will. And he said, well, 
Um, he said, I think this is maybe the last one. Do you? And I said, well, yeah, uh, you know, never say never, but yeah, it, 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 it probably will be. So there was that feeling between us that this was probably the last time we were going to do it. And, uh, you know, what a great crowd. We had nearly 2,000 people there. And, you know, the energy in that room, it, 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 it was really fantastic because, you know, as soon as he walked in, he got a standing ovation. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't have to say a word. He just walked on stage and got this massive applause and the floor started shaking. And you think, my God, you know, this is fantastic. You know, the power of anybody to do that is, is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's like I say. The first time I saw him, it was exactly the same standing ovation and just just this this look on everybody's face of just like the the magical sort of like ten year old inside you. You know, all yeah. those memories of watching Spy Love Me when you were a kid came back, and there's the man on the stage being the the legend that he was. But so let me ask you a question then. With with uh, when you, whenever you listen to Sir Rog, people would ask him about you know the, his favourite film he'd made. You know whether that was Bond or, or not Bond, and he'd always say about the man who haunted himself. Yeah. He was super proud of that. Are there any from your perspective? Are there any kind of like hidden gems of Sir Roger's work that perhaps doesn't get that much attention, but you think? Uh, yeah, I think there are a few. I mean, there's a film called The Naked Face. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, yeah. Written by Sidney Sheldon, directed by Brian Forbes. It was a film in 1986, I think, 1985-1986, made yeah. by Golan and Globus, Canon. And the thing with Golan and Globus uh, was that they would often find a star uh, and just sell a picture on the back of that star. It didn't matter too much about the script. But Roger had just retired as Bond, and they went to him, and they said, look, is there a movie you want to do? Because whatever you want to do, we'll fund it. You know, a Roger Moore movie for us would be great. Yeah. And he said, yeah, okay. Uh, he said, I've read this book by Sidney Sheldon. It's called Naked Face. I'd like to do it. I'd like Brian Forbes to direct it. And they said, okay, we'll do it. And and I don't quite know what was happening at the time within the company. I think they were in financial difficulties because when the film came to be released, it didn't get much of a, a sort of a cinema release. And it was also an 18 certificate, which I think put a lot right. of people off. They thought it was going to be a really violent film. And it, it's not. It's, it's, yeah. it's a very yeah. good thriller. I mean, there's a bit of violence in it, but it, it's an interesting story. And he's very good in it, I have to say. And David Hedison's in it with him, and Anne Archer's in it with him. And, uh, you know, it, Elliot Gould is in there, Art Carney's in there, Rod Steiger's in there. And he was very proud of it because, he, you know, he thought it was a good story. But it was just the film company behind it. They, they didn't quite know how to release it. I think that was the problem because it was an 18 certificate. It wasn't Roger playing this sort of James Bond type super, superhero character. Yeah, He was a fallible character. He was a man who was grieving for his wife. He was a psychiatrist. And the story is basically that this lady turns up just to talk. He didn't ask who she was, you know, client confidentiality. And it turns out to be she is the wife of the local mobster. And right. this monster thinks that she's telling the psychiatrist all of his secrets. So it's quite a taut thriller. So that one, definitely. Man Who Haunted Himself, he was extremely proud of. And uh, Cannonball Run he loved because he said it was just sort of three or four weeks of absolute fun. You know, working yeah. with Reynolds and Dean Martin. And, you know, he said, my God, you know, going to work with these guys, it was just absolute fun. So thing, you know, things like that where he had great fun and films he felt that had a good story and, you know, he was a guy, he, he actually was a producer as well because um, he was head of Brute Films, which was Fabergé. Uh, Cary Grant got him involved with that. And the first, he was head of production. The first film he commissioned was A Touch of Class, which Glenda Jackson won the Oscar for. Right. And, you know, this shows the man's thinking. You know, he saw this script. He thought this would be a good script to film. Glenda Jackson would be good in it. And, and she won the Oscar. So... You know, he, he he was very astute, and he made a lot of films just for the money, a bit like Michael Caine. You know, he said, if somebody comes along and offers me a million dollars to work for three days, who am I to say no? You know, an accident of life is never a certain one. And, yeah, he, he was guilty of taking the paycheck. But at the same time, he turned a lot of stuff away. He really turned a lot of stuff away because he didn't want to be associated with that type of Bond, retired spy character all the time. You know, he said, I've yeah. done that. And and it's something that was a bit tasteless. He turned it away. He he turned away an episode of Absolutely Fabulous because he he just said, "I think it's just a bit tasteless. The humour is below the belt." And he said, "I'm not going to do it." Yeah. So he was quite principled. It's a funny it's one, a, though, isn't it? People assume 
act as a sort of different to anybody else. You know, if anybody offers you a million pounds for anything, you're going to think about it at least. You know what I mean? And it, it's that. Well, yeah. Kind of, you know, things, he, he would always ask me to read a script if it came in, um, partly because he was a bit lazy, but partly because he also wanted somebody to filter it to say, you know, I think this is really good. You should read it. You know, he wanted that yeah. sort of feedback. <clears throat> and I know he was offered a Spanish film, um, English speaking character. And he said, would you read it? I said, yeah, okay. And I think I got to page three or page four, and I stopped reading. And, and he phoned me up. He said, what do you think of the script? And I said, I didn't like it. I haven't got beyond page four. He said, why? I said, well, your character is an elderly man in a wheelchair. The first scene is um, a young girl going down on him, giving him a blowjob. And then there's another scene involved. He said, don't, don't say any more. I'm not going to do that. He said, think of UNICEF. What the hell would they say? One of their ambassadors in the film, please. And and I said, well, look, there's a lot of money. I said, they're offering, I think it was a million dollars for that, actually. Yeah. Uh, I said, they're offering a lot of money. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. No. So he's very yeah. principled. What a man, what a man. So uh, one of the, the things uh, I, I noticed, that I think it was a, a couple of Bond stars, uh, again, now at Pinewood, um, you guys played the, the sort of memorial tape of Sir Rog where you guys had the, the sort of memorial for him at, at Pinewood. And, you know, you had Michael Caine there giving a speech and all those kinds of people. And like the, the, the overwhelming thing I, I think when I think of Sir Roger and, you know, his passing is just how loved that man was. You mm. know, it really is that that thing of that, like when we, we did an episode where everybody sort of phoned in a, a voicemail giving their sort of memories of, of Sir Roger and we ended up with like three and a half hours worth of voicemails um, of people sort of pouring their hearts out and stuff. I've never known anything like it before. When when a celebrity's passed away, most of the time it's like, ah, oh, damn, I was a big fan of that person. But mm. when it came to Sir Roger, I've never known such an emotional outpouring and I, I remember when when i had the news i was sitting there i'm like this is crazy because i don't even know the guy like I've, I've met him very briefly a couple of times and chatted to him on skype but i feel like a member of my family's gone it's it was such oh. a deep deep feeling you know um and you could you could see it on on people's faces on that on that video as well you know what a what a what a horrible thing yeah you know, through, he, you know he was a guy who touched so many lives i mean yes there were his friends yes there were his colleagues and you know the day he died was just inundated with emails from all of his friends around the world who mm. some knew he was ill, some didn't. And, you know, it's like hundreds of emails coming in and tweets and Facebook messages, people he'd never known, people he'd never met, yet he touched their yeah. lives. And you think, you know, this, this humble son of a policeman from South London is being mourned by people he never even met or knew or interacted with. And <laughs> cinema marquees in London were putting up Roger Moore R.I.P. And, you know, Park Circus, who distribute the Bond films, uh, they phoned me up and said, we want to make next week a uh, worldwide Roger Moore Day, and we're going to re-release two of his movies. Is that okay? I said, of course it's okay. And I went to one of those yeah. screenings in London, and it was packed. And, you know, it's so touching that yeah. he was a man who he never had any any enemies really i suppose he had a few people who begrudged him success um but there, there was never any nasty uh, obituaries written i mean a few people joked about his acting ability and they always would i mean you know i think i mentioned yeah. the books quentin letts who's a critic for the daily mail um you know he would always have a slight dig at roger and talk about his silly little renditions as 007 Right. And I think Roger tweeted him back once and said, well, I read this silly renditions as 007. And I thought to myself, sitting on my Monte Carlo back balcony, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, he, he just touched so many lives, people who watched his movies, people who read his books, people who'd donated to UNICEF because they'd heard him mm. make an impassioned appeal. And, and we had so many letters afterwards from people saying we are now making regular donations to UNICEF in his memory. And he would have loved that, you know, that, that to yeah. him was very important. That's a beautiful thing. I, I think somebody like that, like I was saying before, somebody who's genuinely a really positive sort of a positive soul and a really, a really good person. It's like, as soon as I read that he didn't like foie gras and we shouldn't eat foie gras. And I, not that that was a regular part of, of my uh, intake, but uh, 
yeah, I, I never ate again after that. I was like, that's it. If Roger says I'm not allowed to eat foie gras, I'm not allowed to eat foie gras. Well, it was just because of the cruelty. Yeah. I mean, he said for many yeah. years he ate it. Didn't know the cruelty involved in stuffing pipes down geese and uh, ducks' throats and force-feeding them until their liver expands and expands to the point where they're in such pain yeah. that they're then killed and their liver is taken and used as a delicacy. And he said, how on earth can any person say that foie gras is an accepted sort of luxury food when the cruelty yeah. behind it is horrific? Mm. And he petitioned, I mean, I think it was Selfridges who was one of the major sellers of foie gras in London. And he pestered Selfridges. He put advertising hoardings in bus stops saying, stop selling foie gras. Wow. Um, we had an email from Selfridges um, owners saying, back off on the publicity and we'll drop foie gras. Okay, you've won. Wow. And he said, well, that's one little victory. But whenever he went to a dinner party, if foie gras was on the menu, he mm. would say to the host very quietly, he would say, unfortunately, I can't eat it. And can I explain to you why? And before you knew it, it was taken off that menu that day. Nice. So it was never served. So he was very passionate about so many things. He did it very quietly, uh, didn't make a big fuss about some things, but I think did make a difference. And that, that's why he affected so many lives, because he made so much of a difference in so many areas of life. What a legend. What a legend indeed. So then I won't take up uh, too much more of your time, Gareth, but I, I do have some uh, some questions for you about No Time to Die and uh -huh. and, and your thoughts about what's coming for Bond in the in the you know in the in the modern day. So do you have have you got any rituals for watching a new Bond for the first time? What what does what's when you um, sit down to watch a brand new Bond, what's 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 your go to sort of setup? Uh, well, not really. I mean Funnily enough, the last couple of premieres, uh, Spectre and Skyfall, I was on stage with Roger uh, those particular nights. I think once we were in Basingstoke for Skyfall and the next time we were in Liverpool. And people were saying, you know, why aren't you at the premiere? And he said, well, I'm here talking to you. Um, so I, I've been to a couple of premieres. I've been to three premieres, I think. Great fun to go to. Um, and then those we saw at the cinema. Well, no, I tell a lie. Skyfall. Yeah, Skyfall. Um, I said to Eon, you know, we're going on tour. We're not going to be able to come to the premiere. Is there a chance Roger can see it? And they said, yeah. Would you like a private screening? I said, well, yeah, fine. And it was actually on one of our days off, they arranged in um, Sony at Golden Square, the screening room. It was on a Sunday, I think. And they said, you know, come down and see the movie. And they put the movie on. And Roger said, well, you must come. So he invited me. And we sat there and we watched the movie. And he turned to me at the end and he said, that was fucking good, wasn't it? <laughs> and, I said, yeah. and then the next time Spectre we went to a, on a day off I think it was the day after it premiered we were in Jared's Cross and we went to the little cinema there every man and um, didn't make a big fuss I did say to the manager he was coming simply because I wanted a parking space for him to park around the back <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and when, when he arrived it was so funny because he arrived literally five minutes before the curtain went up because he'd been stuck in traffic and we, we sat down at the back and a really nice cinema, quite luxury. And um, the manager, the cinema had just opened. It had been refurbished and it just opened again. And the manager came in at the front and he, he said to everybody, you know, I hope you enjoy our new cinema. And if it's a bit too hot, let us know. If it's a bit too cold, let us know. If you'd like yeah. more drinks, you know, you just order and we'll bring them to your table. And he said, now settle back and please watch this wonderful movie with the second best James Bond. <laughs> and we all sort of, second best James Bond? And Roger was saying, what was that, darling? He said to Christine, and she said, the second best James Bond. He said, oh, who's the first best James Bond? And she said, well, you are, darling. He said, oh, yeah. And they're going, shh, shh, shh. And turning around, <laughs> not knowing it was him. Yeah. So when the lights came up at the end and he stood up and people sort of clocked him, they went, what? So, you know, so the last couple I've seen with Roger, which was really nice. I mean, this one, yeah. I'll probably just go to the local cinema, I think, whenever he comes out. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. So what, what's your being a man, you know, at Pinewood and uh, being close to the action, so to speak, what's your thoughts on the, on the whole Danny Boyle thing? Do you think we sidestepped a potential crazy disaster well, or do you think we missed out on a gem there with that? I don't know because he was so enthusiastic about it. And um, a friend of mine, Alan Tompkins, who you've had on your show before, art director, yeah. extraordinaire. Um, Alan, went over to see Mark Tildesley, who was the production designer, because he'd heard that Mark wanted a copy of his book, Stars and Wars. Right. And Alan being the sort of 
great salesman he is, he said, well, I'll come in and I'll go over. But Alan went over to the art department and, uh, you know, left a copy for Mark Tilsley. And then he got a phone call saying, next time you're in, Danny Boyle wants a copy. Could you drop one in? Nice. And so Alan went in and Danny Boyle welcomed Alan like some great long lost friend and said, right, I've got some money here, Alan. Come on in. Come and have a look at the art department. And he said, oh, we're doing some great. And he was so enthusiastic. And then three days later, he left the picture. So, you know, he really was enthusiastic. He was getting into it. Um, I think he would have done something very interesting. Maybe it's not quite what they wanted. You know, there's a certain formula, isn't there, for making a Bond film? Of course. And he wanted to take it in a slightly more, I don't know, left wing or slightly steer it more left than they wanted. You know, they didn't want some of the stuff. And, did you did you get a flavour of what sort of direction he was going to go in? Or I, I think it was going to be quite dark. I mean, there was talk on not making it to the end of the film. Um, and there was talk about him being in a cage fight, I think, in the opening sequence. Um, <laughs> would Bond be in a cage fight? I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know, it's one of those things. You, you With a Bond, you don't just have one script. You know, you have a script that is written and rewritten and rewritten and improved on and rewritten, and then other people come in. And it could have evolved, but yeah. I think the first draft maybe scared them a little bit. And uh, Danny Boyle was of the opinion that if his writer, John Hodge, couldn't join him with his usual yeah. team, then it was no go. So it's sad, sad. Huh. It's one of those uh, great what might have been things, isn't it? When you think about it and you imagine, you know, you hear stories about Quentin Tarantino wanting to make Casino Royale back in the day and you, your imagination goes crazy thinking like, I wonder what that would have been like, you know, it's, uh, it's yeah. the imagination going. Doesn't well, it? who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But what, uh, so what are your, what are your hopes for No Time to Die as is? Are you, are you, uh, are you feeling, because obviously there's been so many setbacks and craziness and changes and chopping and changing. Are you, yeah. are you feeling confident like it's going to be a, a solid picture? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, from what I've seen so far, it looks really good. I mean, the trailers look good. But then again, I suppose in an hour, well, no, two hour, 45 minute movie, if you can't find three decent minutes of trailer material, then you're in the wrong job. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think it, there's, a, there's a huge appetite for this film. Absolutely huge. It's yeah. Daniel Craig's last one, maybe. And I think it's going to be a good story because it's got a lot of dots to, to, to sort of put and, t, you know, I's to dot and T's to cross and they want yeah, to finish yeah. the, the arc, as they call it, don't they? And uh, I think it'll be interesting to, to see all the characters come back and yeah. uh, complete their storyline. Absolutely. Big time, big time. Can't wait for it. So last question then, what's next for Gareth Owen? Have we got any more books being cooked up? I imagine at the current time, you've got a lot of time sitting at home like the rest of us. So are you, are you cooking up anything for, uh, uh, for the future? Well, yeah, I've got a couple of fingers in pies and I'm hoping, well, I've started doing a, a biography of Stanley Baker, the actor who nice. is a Welshman like myself, best known from Zulu, of course, which he starred in and produced. But Stanley Bates, fascinating. He, he was uh, offered Dr. No, actually, to play Bond because uh, he was a friend of Cubby Broccoli. But um, he declined because yeah. he said, I don't want to be tied to a six-film contract. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting character. So as a producer, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an actor, and you know, an all-round good guy, I'm, I'm working on that at the moment. His widow is still with us. She's about 94, so I've been interviewing her. Wow. Uh, hoping to get back to that soon. Lovely stuff. Can't wait for it. Good stuff. Well, thank you for joining me, Gareth. It's been uh, it's been quite illuminating, as Sir well, Roger sorry, says. Sorry about, sorry about the light. I, I've got this <laughs> skylight here in my little office den, and uh, I didn't realise this time of day the sun absolutely comes straight down through it. No yeah. worries. No worries at all, my man. But, uh, my, but thank you my, again. It's my halo. That's what it is. <laughs> to everybody uh, listening at home, make sure you go and uh, grab a copy of Raising an Eyebrow, My Life with Sir Roger Moore by Gareth Dine. You will love it. I must, I've got to congratulate you again on that book because I, I literally, like I said, fired through it in two sittings and oh. I, I laughing out loud throughout. And Thank obviously you. there are some sad moments as well that, that sort of bring a tear to the eye. But uh, but yeah, what a what a great book. Really loved Lovely. it. You really did him justice. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. I will see you soon, Gareth. Cheers. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night.